Market observations for Logan, Brisbane, Queensland. Let's jump right into this one because it has been requested multiple times from you, our audience. So if you would like us to focus on a particular suburb, a particular local government area or city across Australia, Australia only at this point, please let us know in the comments below. Your thoughts would be much appreciated. It's really good when we see people who do live in the area confirming or contradicting or creating conversation around our observations. Those local observations are critical to us as investors. If you would like to work out where we are buying for my friends and family in this current environment, I've got a free 25 minute training video in the comments below, uh, sorry, in the description below. It's the first sentence there, the first link in that description. There's no cost. In two minutes from now, you could be there settled in watching that 25 minute free training, learning about the exact types of properties and locations we are buying in for myself, friends and family right as of today. So jump in there, please do. Without further ado, uh, I am conscious of time with these market observations. Let's jump right in. Property investment is a science. I do reiterate this every time. Firstly, we are looking at a larger area. A local government area usually works very well because it has similar policies, similar planning policies, similar approvals, building policies, similar sort of employment and changes to a local government area. It's usually a good number of people it's, it's worthwhile at the local government area level to determine the overall scope or size or quantum of the opportunity. Is the predicted performance worthy of our attention? Then once we've located an area that is worthy of our attention, we have to determine, is this the right time to be buying there? Is it in the right buying window uh, for us to generate a strong return soon after purchase and not accumulate opportunity costs, buying a property that doesn't move in value for some time after purchase. We want to get that right. So there is two parts of this equation. If you see a simplified one score, one number, it's too simplified. It's giving you the where or the when, not both. And you need to have both. It's very important. So let's jump in. Let's define the opportunity first. What is the quantum, the size, the scope of this opportunity in Logan, south of Brisbane? For those of you that don't know, Logan is wedged between the Gold Coast and Brisbane. When you include Ipswich, I call it the Golden Triangle, Logan is smack bang right in the middle. Traditionally, it has been the darling and the unloved child of many property investors in the country. It is cause of great debate. People are pro-Logan or negative anti-Logan and they have very strong opinions on the topic. We've had a lot of investors I've worked with closely over the years who have bought there 10 years ago who haven't done so well. Others who have been able to navigate and you know, eke out some returns over time. Today we're going to be investigating what is going on in recent times in Logan and what is set into the immediate future. So I'm sure it's going to create a lot of conversation. But at this point, Logan, the theory is well, the Gold Coast is going ahead, Brisbane's going ahead, so Logan, a lower socio area typically, is going to be sucked up. Okay, it's going to be gentrified because of its proximity to both. It is very well positioned. But there is one major concern with Logan. It has been a, a, you know, a, a home for property spruikers and developers for some time. There's a lot of suburbs that have been created there wholesale in the last few years. We, it is a minefield. We've got socioeconomic issues that we do need to be attentive of. We have core drivers of utility that do have to match with these factors we've just spoken of. So we have to navigate this minefield very closely. Typically investors have like Logan, good yields, good affordable properties. You know, the logic is let's buy low and ride it through and gentrify the area and we're set to, be, set, set to, to benefit. Let's see if that's possible. Very diverse employment, big tick. Income growth, very slow. Okay, you'd expect that from a low socio area. Commute times, 21 minutes for Brisbane is excellent. People commuting north and south, working within the area. So it's excellent commuting, diverse employment, but you know we have to start questioning the caliber of the employment. Unemployment rate up towards nine or eight percent here. Okay, six to nine, about eight percent. It is trending upwards in the last couple of years. Okay, it has stabilized, but it is starting to trend upwards in recent times. That is a concern, all right? That is probably the reason why we have lower, you know, very low income growth nationally, you know, when compared to the nation. We've got diverse employment, doesn't take long for people to get to their jobs, 
but unemployment rate is high and therefore income growth is low. A bit of a concern there from unemployment. New projects on the horizon, I won't spend too much here because it is a capital project, you know, um, Logan overall. It is average in terms of the new projects on the horizon. Population growth, it is always one of the key storylines of Logan. Good, strong population growth. We forecast it, I'll move out of the way. We forecast it to continue at a little bit above the national average, 6% projected for the next three years. Great, but remember, population growth is a secondary data signal for capital growth. Sometimes areas might have low population growth, but that means there might be 10 times as many people piled up wanting to move there, but just don't have the homes for them to move into. This is a story where we do have high population growth, but they have to have houses to move into, and there's definitely lots of that in the area. Amenities, as you would expect from a capital city, large capital city, very, very good, lots of good lifestyle factors. You know, it has the beach nearby, it has the Gold Coast, but internally, good shopping, good transport, all of these wonderful things. This is where we start discussing and investigating the supply. This is a very unique map to what we have here. It combines recent construction and the forward-looking approvals pipeline. Very difficult data for us to collate and bring together. So I'm just gonna get my mouse organized here. This is our map here so we can drag it around. All right, you can see Brisbane here. You can see Gold Coast to the south. You can see Logan extending inland quite a lot. And as we go inland, some of the newer suburbs are very large geographic areas, less density there. But you can see, you know, when we zoom in here, a lot of these more established areas, Woodridge, Slacks Creek, uh, into what's this one, Logan Central, Kingston, Meadowbrook, Marsden. These are all very familiar names to me. And I'm sure they are to other investors that have been around the traps for, you know, the last decade or so, uh, if not longer. Right, these are established areas with good scarcity drivers. That's what we need as an investor. You come in here though, and you look just to the south. This Logan Reserve suburb has had 28% new housing construction as of now in the last year, essentially, just looking backwards and forwards. 28% in the pipeline. Guys, we know overall, look at uh, what's this Park Ridge as well, 21.4%. Overall, when we've got 2% population moving towards the area per annum, we can see where they're moving into. It is an absolute minefield. A lot of these more established areas, Eagleby, Carbrook, uh, Cornubia, excuse my pronunciation there guys, all already built out. But then guess what? Right in the middle, Logan Home. Almost 10% new construction in the pipeline. Right? What do you think that's going to do for growth pressure? Right? We remember growth occurs from demand and supply. We might have good demand, population growth, but we've got a lot of supply. The problem with Logan, right? and this is, might be controversial, the problem with Logan, typically when we come into these types of areas, Ipswich is a good example as well. We've, sure, we've got all these wonderful things happening. We've got population growing. We've got a lot of people coming towards the area. We typically stay away from these high supply areas and we focus our attention on the established areas that have already been built out close to key commuter and utility drivers like train lines, shopping centers, you know, school enclaves, etc. The problem with Logan is it doesn't resolve. When we take that approach and buy in these areas that are already built out close to those key amenities, we have really strong issues with socioeconomic factors like public housing, the wrong types of properties for the area, a lot of townhouses in Woodridge and those surrounding areas, we have the wrong property type, okay? So this is a compromised area. Those areas that are scarce with lot, little new housing supply are compromised by low socio factors and the wrong types of properties. The street level and property level dynamic is not right. Let's try and see if we can find some areas in this area that we might potentially be worthy of our attention, but we have to stick to these established markets. Let me move back to the slides. Overall, when you take all of these things into consideration, Logan's actually not doing too badly, right? At a national level, 
It's been pulled up by the bootstraps overall from Brisbane. The projections for the mid, short to mid term, you know, out to five, six, seven years are very good. We've got good predicted performance overall for Logan. The patchy employment landscape is offset by the great lifestyle factors at this price point, right? Also, okay new projects. And when you get the suburbs right, the supply is okay. We can manage that, all right? So overall, it's actually scoring quite well, and it's probably been you know, piggybacking on the overall Brisbane opportunity. But is this the right time to buy there? And then if it is the right time to buy there, let's leave ourselves that final question, can we actually buy there? Are there the right street level dynamics to actually successfully purchase? Purchase analysis, days on market, 20 slightly on the way up, we look here, we had a tightening in the market in February, March. That's going to be a trend, but still houses in the red are still very low. Slight trend upwards, still very low. We see there was dramatically high competition in the earlier months of this year, and it has tapered off dramatically into May and into June. All right, so this was a period when the market was really pumping. All right. And we can see, this is confirmation now, that the really things started to slow down slightly in February and March in this market. We can see we sucked out of the supply out of the market. The high competition drew supply out of the market. We can see red houses here. We're at a low point where, uh, we, you know, we didn't have a huge amount of properties on the market over the long term, you know, looking at the long term moving average for the area. But that's just, that course is now changing. That direction, that trend line is now changing. You can see in recent months, stocks not turning over as it once was. Inventory levels are starting to increase. Days of supply is starting to trend up. Remember, days of supply is a function or looks at the inventory levels and how many properties are generally selling per day. So we know the inventory levels are increasing. The number of properties selling per day might be slightly increasing or okay as well but days of supply is on the way up. We have the pressure, the steam releasing from this market. I'd love to hear your comments in the section below. What do you think is the greatest cause for the steam to leave a market? Bonus points if you have seen these videos and you might know, it'd be great for you to comment below. This gives you a little bit of a hint. Increased prices are a great pressure release valve. As prices increase, it is a hand break, break, break on demand. Less people have the willingness to pay more expensive property prices for that same area. We can see here, this was when the real pressure was occurring in the market, and the market has continued to push on since then. This is asking price. But this shows us a change in direction. As that asking price was increasing, the Percentage above, you know, this is the discounting amount. Prices were selling for 7% above asking price. And this is now course corrected. We can see this pressure release valve being applied where things are coming back down to earth. Sales agents, vendors, expectations, they're all getting a little bit more uh, on the mark. Prices and negotiations might not be as fierce. There might not be as many people overlapping. Remember, as recently as May into June, Brisbane itself was still performing extremely strongly capital growth-wise. This is not a story of macro influences. This is not a story of interest rate rises, you know, Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera. Brisbane market is still powering ahead in certain locations. This is a localized change of direction. If I was to say, based on this data, the peak of the market was in March, right? And this has been, this was the, end of the, and now we're entering a consolidation period. Prices are still rocketing ahead, right? But we know that the peak, the steam is now leaving the market. So how long this continues to move? It's anyone's guess, but it's definitely not a time to be buying into this market. Let's have a look at the rental side of the equation. Let's see if there's any, you know, other outlying drivers that might potentially blow this balloon back up again right? Put some steam back into the market. This is a pretty simple concept. Especially in times like this, investors chase yield. They chase, you know, the actual cash return on the investments in their pocket. Investors are moving around in different asset classes, always chasing yield. And when you're talking about property, you're talking about mums and dads actually living in a property, 
that chase of yield is amplified. Mums and dads, rent's going up, they can't afford to buy, sorry, they can't afford to rent in that area, rents are going through the roof, they move over to the buy side. So you see the rent market leading the buy side market in many of these types of locations. You also see investors, when that yield increases into a market, investors turn their attention to it because they chase yield, and then they pile into the market and that really sets a fire under things. You've got essentially two extra buying groups moving into a market. That's when you really start seeing markets getting carried away and running away with, with capital growth. Obviously then, rents slow down, people have moved over the buy side, rents start slowing down, the, the price growth, as you're seeing in this market, starts slowing down. And because you've had all this price growth with rents stabilized, the yields have dropped. So the investors leave the market. Okay, that's the cycle at a high level. Here, let's see if there is still that rental health that could show and illustrate that even when a buying window has just closed, it might only be a matter of months until it opens again. Or it could be a few years, we don't know. Days on rental market extremely tight. Vacancy rate, extremely tight and stable. The yield, as I say, has dropped. Rents haven't quite kept pace with price growth. You'd expect a little bit more than 3.75% yield in Logan. I'll give you the hot tip. I wouldn't consider it until it's starting with a five, if it was me. So you can see here, we've still got a lot of work to do for prices to slow down and rents catching up. But, Indications are, as of June, that rents are still powering ahead for houses in this market. This has to continue for some time. Remember, we don't expect this type of market to go backwards in, term of pri in terms of price. We've got the Labor Help to Buy scheme. We've got a lot of pressure on sub $500,000 properties in this type of climate. This is where we expect good rock solid uh, results. So we don't expect prices to come off the boil. We need rents to continue their upwards trend for another six or 12 months get yields up towards close to 5%, the high point in the cycle, very important, the high point in the cycle for this location, and then we would see that move from the rent to the buy side once again. So we've still got a lot of correction, a lot of you know, building and consolidating to do here in Logan before the next real major upswing. I'm gonna leave that there. Summary, good opportunity in the long term, we have to pick our spots away from new supply, Focus on established areas. But as you'll see in a moment, we need to be very fussy about the street level dynamic. Low socio areas play a big part in this local government area. We have missed our buying window, guys. Right, this is now in a consolidation phase. It's not our time to be moving into the Logan market. Now let's have a look at some of the individual suburb dynamics. I have loaded up here, uh, what's this suburb, sorry. Um, let me zoom in. Woodridge. Okay, so we've chosen Woodridge. For those that you don't know, Woodridge, good accessibility to train line, an established area in Logan. And I'm using this to illustrate my point. We have to be very, very careful at the street level dynamic. You can see here in Woodridge, it looks good on paper, but it only has 36% owner occupiers. It's not enough. We don't have those core owner-occupier drivers. I might skip through this vendor discounting. You can see this one has already come well and truly off the boil. Okay, a lot of these suburbs are still up at 8%. So prices are selling for 8% more than the asking price here in Meadowbrook area. We, we still might have a lot of heat in this market whilst it really has come off the boil through these sectors. So you need to understand this at the suburb level. It's critical. You can see here how yields have already dropped way off the boil. 4% yield in Woodridge is just not acceptable. We need more than that to be moving into these lower socio areas, guys. And you can see that there's a mismatch. Some of the higher yielding areas have, if you can remember back, a lot of supply coming into them. That was the map that we looked at previously where a lot of this south area had a lot of supply coming into it. So once again, we have another mismatch. Vacancy rates extremely tight, very low through these pockets. That's a bullish sign from the rental side, but remember, you have to look at the types of properties that are being rented and bought in these locations, and are they investment grade properties? Days of supply, pretty consistent. You can see here in these markets, where there's 29% properties being built, if you can remember, 
we have 390 days of supply sitting there in the pipeline, okay? It's gonna take a while to get through that. Whilst just north of that next door, we have days on supply at 50, 58, 55. That's what we would expect, right? Even Sabo's next door here, 80 to 144, we need to understand these subtleties. You know, for me, I'm really sticking into these established areas, nice, tight, 29 days of supply. So let's just run down a little bit. I'm gonna to skip to street by street comparison for Woodridge. Let's have a look at occupancy type. There are some clusters, 18% owner occupiers. Four out of five people are renting in that street. Okay, that street pocket. Have a think about what that does for owner occupier appeal, people improving their properties, you know, um, you know, pulling their area up by its bootstraps. It's not really gonna be happening when you have the majority of people as tenants and you know, maybe even interstate investors owning those properties. You know they're trying to get a return from their investments. They're doing as little maintenance as possible, et cetera, et cetera. There are some exceptions, you know, clusters of 60% owner occupiers here. That's still not enough. I still like to see more than that in an area to have that really strong owner occupier appeal. Property type, we need to get this right, okay? The strongest demand in this market is for houses. This is what we need to be focusing on in, in, as investors. We need land. Land appreciates, buildings depreciate. We need scarcity driven by a lack of land and then build a good quality home on it or buy a good quality home, an established dwelling in an established area with no more land. Okay, it's very simple. We don't need to play around the edges. We can see here there are some areas in this suburb that have basically no houses. They are units only. If you bought a house here, you've bought a white elephant. If you bought buy a unit here, where there's 100% houses, you've buy, bought a white elephant. You need to get the exact type of property for the street level dynamic right. We need to get that match right. Now, we're seeing a lot of renters and a lot of units in certain parts of this suburb. Hint, hint. Sold prices, sometimes we don't have enough sales here to get a, a reliable sample, but we can see some patches of high prices and some patches of very low prices in this suburb. Double, 350 through to $760,000 is the street level median, the street cluster level median in this suburb. Extreme price disparity. Rental price, a stable rental horizon. 300, 280, very low social areas, up to 380. It's quite a flat terrain. So we've had double the variance in price and about 25, 30% variance, one third variance in rent, right? So yields are gonna fluctuate dramatically across this suburb. And yes, they will. 6% yield in some streets, 3% yield in others. Why is this occurring? We have 38.9% public housing in that street area. Now, I grew up from a background where we didn't have much growing up, okay? I understand how this all fits together, but I just wanna pitch it to you and propose it to you. What can you imagine the street level dynamic would be in that area? Social housing does wonderful things for many people, but as an investor, I'm not gonna be buying in a street that has 38.9% public housing, right? You can imagine what has to change or occur in that street for outstanding capital growth to occur. We did a lot of research a few years ago around public housing. 0% public housing in metro areas across Australia, you can expect almost 25% above average capital growth when compared to the suburb overall. And anytime you have over 15% public housing, you'd expect 20% less relative capital growth to the suburb overall. So this area might go ahead 10%, this is only going ahead 8%, okay? It's extremely sensitive. So we have to get this street level right. So high level summary, let's leave it there guys. Good overall long-term performance or projected performance for the area, okay? We have to be very careful of supply. And the problem with Logan is the areas that are established are a minefield. They don't really have the right mix of opportunity. But anyway, it's a moot point because the buying window in Logan was about three to four or five months ago. So this has been a good investigation. If you like this type of content, let me know. 
I really love the comments that come through on this channel. It really does motivate what we do. Chris behind me over here and many other people in the business do a lot of work to create this type of content. So please, any positive feedback, share it with friends. If you see Logan mentioned on the forum, just drop the link into the video. And let's create the discussion around it. People need to know this information. So let's inform the country, do that duty and pass the information on. It's critically important. It would mean a lot to me, but it is also helping other people. All right. If you like what you're seeing and you want to see more of it, hit the su subscribe button, click the bell icon so you're the first to be notified and like this video. It will be much appreciated. And once again, if you'd like to know the exact types of properties in the exact streets that I am buying for myself, friends and family right now, view our 25 minute free explainer training disco or discovery video. Uh, the link to that one is the first link there in the description of this video. Thank you and good luck out there. Cheers.